title of my message today is Jai 2020. And what I want to share with you are perspectives we need for the journey towards our dreams. All of us have dreams, right? Now, this is going to be a great compass for many of you in 2020, but these are also going to be attitudes that will really help you as you move through life and move through your goals for your future, okay? So, Jai, J-I-B-E. Now, not to be confused with one of its definitions, which means to taunt, to make fun of, or to insult, to, to jibe somebody, okay? Yeah. No, the particular jibe I'm talking about today refers to a sailing maneuver, whereby a sailing vessel reaching downwind turns its stern into the wind such that uh, the wind direction changes from one side of the boat to the other. So, so in simpler ways that you can understand this, it means to shift the sail of a ship from one side to the other in order to harness the wind direction. Sailors deploy this move to propel their boat into more efficient speeds and trajectories. Now, another definition for the word jibe that is also relevant to today's, to today's message is to be in accord or agreement with, compatible, similar, or consistent. And that's what I want to encourage all of you here to do in 2020. Whatever your dreams are, harness the winds that you are dealt with. Use whatever life brings you in 2020 to get to who you want to become. So instead of a Bible verse today, right, I want to be very pagan and kick things off with a quote from Charles Darwin. Is that okay? I mean, we are the evolution after all, right? And he was a Christian, by the way, whom the church misguidedly turned against for having a scientific mind and questions, okay? So he said this, It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. So the ones of us here who will be the most successful, who will fulfill great dreams, are not necessarily the strongest or the most intelligent, but the ones who are the most adaptable, the most changeable. The ones who can flow and jive with whatever life throws your way. Amen? So 30 years ago, a psychologist named Carol Dweck decided to study attitudes that led to success and attitudes that led to mediocrity. And she ended up publishing her findings in a groundbreaking book called Mindset, the new psychology of success. Yeah. Now, in it, she, she says, she observes that there are two different approaches to life. Uh, what she calls, firstly, a fixed mindset versus another which is called a growth mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And she found that people with fixed mindsets tended to believe that it is the measure of their talents and abilities and intelligence that would be what determines their success. So these people tended to be rigid in their perceptions and plans when it came to success. Yeah. Yeah. And usually they ended up with mediocre results. Yeah. Interesting, right? Yeah. But people who had growth mindsets, on the other hand, believed that their talents and abilities could be developed through consistency and dedication. Yeah. Wow. They tended to love learning and have resilience and adaptability in the face of failure or plans for their lives changing. Yes. And this actually led to significantly greater and long-term outcomes. Yes. So in other words, if you want to be a success, learn to love growth yes. and adaptation. Yes. Love jibing with whatever life brings you. So today, right, I have four perspectives that, are going to, that I'm going to share with you to help you do that. And the first is joy in adversity. So, James 1, 2 to 5 says this, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Yeah. Now, joy, listen guys, is one of the, you may not know this, but one of the most mentioned words in the Bible. In Hebrew alone, the word joy and all its variants occurs more than 400 times. 
Now, joy in our Bible takes on various forms, okay, to name a few. There is joy that comes from grace. And this type of joy is what Jesus talks about in John 15, where he talks about how being loved unconditionally by God brings a person joy. And he tells us to always stay in that, that, that knowledge, that awareness, live knowing that God loves you because that kind of joy, unconditional love, can make you whole and complete. Yes. Now, a second kind of joy that the Bible mentions is joy that comes from obedience and alignment with the right values. Yeah. When we do that, the Bible tells us we become free from the burden of sin and a guilty conscience. That kind of joy is the kind of joy that brings us freedom, liberty in our spirit. We don't have to look over our shoulder all the time or worry that something we did in the past is going to catch up with us. So you can understand how joy can come that way, right? From obedience. But the Bible also talks about a third kind of joy that comes from an inner choice about your feelings. That comes from action. Sometimes even speaking and singing joy aloud. Now, one of the Hebrew words for this kind of joy is the word sesson, which means to speak joyfully. Now, incidentally, sesson is also the word that the English word sassy comes from. So sassy actually doesn't mean to taunt or to jibe people or to snap back, but it means to be joyful actually originally. A joyful snapback, a playful snapback, okay? So another Hebrew word for joy is the word ketva, which means to make gladness. So I suspect this was the kind of joy that James, the passage that we just read, was talking about, was writing about. So for all the Christians here, I want you to understand, yes, joy can be supernatural. That, you know, when it comes by grace, from knowing God's love, experiencing God's love when you're touched in an altar call, you're touched during worship. But joy is also an attitude. It is also a decision about our feelings. It is also speaking and actively creating, making joy in our lives. So, so recently I came to know about this research psychologist, this guy named Sean Aker, and he's the He's the author of the best-selling uh, book, The Happiness Advantage, okay? And he found that having joy and increasing joy in a person's life is actually largely practical and doable, yeah. actionable, okay? So here are some of the findings from his research. He found, number one, people who are happy practice regular meditation and reflection. Yeah, yeah supports my sermon from last week, Amen. <laughs> So he found that actually even just five minutes of meditation a day is enough to significantly increase your experience of joy. Five minutes. Number two, people who are happy find things to look forward to. Look forward to. Are you here with me? You know, I don't know, when you're very bored during the week, you know, Monday blues, right? Think of something to look forward to, you know, after you knock off work. I'm going to see this person, I'm going to read this book, I'm going to look at that, I'm going to buy this thing for myself. Joy, okay? Yeah. You increase your joy when you look forward to things. Number three, people who are happy commit to conscious, very specific, not incidental acts of kindness. Okay? Number four, people who are happy infuse joy into the atmosphere around them. Yeah. They make other people happy. They make... They change the culture and the atmosphere in the room. Yeah. Number five, people who are happy, you're going to hate this exercise. <laughs> ta, ta, ta. <laughs> Number six, people who are happy spend money. <laughs> but not on stuff. Okay? You want to find out more? Go read. All right. Number seven. People who are happy actively engage in their signature strengths. They do what they love. They do what they are passionate about. Number eight, people who are happy train their minds to fall up. Okay? Your response to failure. Number nine, 
People who are happy take time to train themselves from negative thought habits to positive thought habits. Train themselves, are you hearing me? So it's not naturally occurring. Number 10, people who are happy make good social investments. Okay, good social investments. So to me, all this really is pretty good news. Because it means that you and me can actually choose joy. I can do joy. I can speak and action joy into a sucky situation. I may not have control over the sucky situation, but I have control over how I feel and how I react to the sucky situation. So, too often, right, I meet Christians and millennials who have gotten into a bad pattern of letting their joy be dependent on their circumstances. Now, I suspect for Christians it's because of a lot of bad church cultures, you know, where they're taught to be emo and they come to church to be ministered to and to like church is a hospital. And so they get into this pattern, right? And I also think it's possibly because they've been reciting too many times the verse, the joy of the Lord is my strength, over and over to themselves. Are you hearing me? You know, did you know that that particular verse, the joy of the Lord is our strength, that we recite so casually over our lives, was actually spoken under the most difficult and unthinkable circumstances that the Jewish people were going through. Yeah. Now, that verse is actually found, it comes from the book of Nehemiah. And at the time, Israel had just finished 70 years of captivity in Babylon, Babylonia, okay? So when the Babylonians conquered Israel, they completely destroyed the city, destroyed the temple, destroyed their homes. And then they carried all the Israelites away to Babylon for 70 years. Now after 70 years, some of the people were allowed to return to their homeland to rebuild. But now, listen, these people who were coming home to rebuild, they were ex-POWs. They were probably suffering from PTSD. They were returning to complete ruins and very little resources. In fact, a lot of the history that's recorded at the time in the Old Testament about them is about their discouragement, about the challenges they had to face in order to rebuild, how they were outnumbered, how they were so tired, how they didn't have enough resources, how disappointed they felt because they would look at what they were rebuilding and it seemed so plain compared to the golden days of Israel that they could remember. So it was in the midst of this, a point of discouragement, that Nehemiah, their leader who was leading the rebuilding, said to them, go home and prepare a feast, holiday food and drink, and share it with those who don't have anything. This day is holy to God. Don't feel bad. The joy of God is your strength. You know, some Christians recite the joy of the Lord is my strength and really, you know, I'm so tired this morning. I only had three hours to see the joy of the Lord is my strength. This is what they were going through. So Nehemiah was saying to these people who were ex-POWs, people who were, you know, suffering from PTSD, who were down and out and discouraged, he was saying to them, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Hey, you know, Here's what I want you to do, guys. I want you to go home, prepare a feast. I want you to share what little you have with those who are poorer than you. I want you to choose to focus on joy and don't feel bad. And that will give you strength. Does that change your perspective? I don't think any of us here are POWs, right? Or experiencing PTSD. Now listen, anyone here suffers from depression, I want to encourage you to keep going. You know, as someone who's been through that, I can tell you it's possible for things to get better. But regardless who you are and what you're experiencing right now, in 2020, I want you to know there's definitely something you can do to make more joy in your life. All of us here, we need to train ourselves to create joy. Because if we want to move towards our dreams, listen, you will face adversity. You will face discouragement and disappointment. You will face delay. And in the midst of that, you need joy in order to overcome. You know, whether the adversity is external or internal, 
whether it's in your control or not in your control, there is one thing that will always be in your control and that is your response to adversity. We can choose joy in adversity. And when we do, that's when energy to achieve returns to us. Drive to be ambitious returns to us. When we do, James also says, you grow stronger. You become more mature. You become more complete and more able to achieve your dreams. Joy and adversity, amen. Now, the second perspective I want to share with you for 2020 is integrity in the fight. Now, I always say this, success is going to be a fight. Otherwise, it's not success, right? It's just mediocrity. But while success is great, it should never come at any cost in your life. You see, Matthew 16, 26, I love this verse where Jesus says, He says, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? I know it's a very straightforward point, right? Integrity. But in my experience, integrity can be very easy to talk about, very tricky to navigate in real life. Now, Integrity 101 is easier, okay? So Integrity 101 is when they go low, you go high. When they backstab, lie, or take advantage, you turn the other cheek. Never become a rat while running the rat race. I don't need to explain that, right? Success shouldn't come at any cost. Galatians 6, 7 to 10 says, Don't be misled. No one makes a fool of God. What a person plants in his life, he will harvest. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others and ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. And all he'll have to show for in his life is weeds. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's Spirit do growth work in him, Harvest a crop of real life, eternal life. So let's not allow ourselves to get fatigued doing good. At the right time, we will harvest a good crop if we don't give up or quit. Right now, therefore, every time we get the chance, let us work for the benefit of all, starting with the people closest to us in the community of faith. Integrity 101. Now, Integrity 102, however, is where it gets tricky. Very often, when we get into a fight for something with someone, we always think that it's about the other person. It's their issue. It's their problem. It's their prejudice. It's their unfairness, right? Now, and to a certain extent, it can be. We've all got betas at work, right? At school and at work, right? Who take advantage of people. But even then, can I tell you, the most important fight is always the one that takes place with yourself. So now when you're running a youth church like me, right, one of the hurdles you will see nearly every youth and young adult cross at some point in their struggle is their fight with their parents. (laughs) Are you here with me? And it's always a very interesting process to observe, okay, looking for that point when a youth or young adult suddenly realizes as they're talking to you, wait a minute, this isn't about my parents. This is about me. Now, and I say this not just with youth who are self-absorbed and want their way, they are youth like that, okay? But this is true even for youth who go through abuse, youth who have bad parents, youth who come from dysfunctional homes. Every person has a point that we have to come to in our lives, sometimes repeatedly over and over again in different relationships and different fights, where we realize that the solution isn't them changing, it's me changing. So for a very long time, right, when I was a pastor, a young pastor, I used to struggle with not being respected as a pastor and a leader. And and this, let me be very real with you, was not ego because I didn't really like the title pastor and it was not 100% self-pity or delusion, okay? This was in a large part actual reality. You know, I would go to pastor network meetings and because I was super young, like 30 years younger than most of the pastors there and the only woman in the room, that most women even, not just the men, wouldn't take me seriously. 
I remember one pastor, when he heard that I preach every week in church, he snickered and said something that implied that my church must be getting very imbalanced or, or very weak because women tend to only preach emotional things. Women are not as gifted as, as men when it comes to interpreting the Bible. Yeah. You know, I remember another pastor asked me to asked meet me to pitch some classes that he wanted to offer to run in our church. And so, you know, let's meet, let me tell you what I'm doing, what I'm capable of doing. And so we did. And in the middle of talking, you know, I was just very encouraging. Oh, great, that's good. I'm not sure we will do it, but, you know, great for you. And he said, oh, it's okay because I just wanted to come and test out my pitch on you before I go and pitch it to other more credible pastors. Like backhanded slap. Are you here with me? So for a long time, I would feel very like, oh, I'm not worthy of being a pastor. And I would get hurt and sometimes angry and disappointed. Yeah. But then, God began to change my perspectives and my mentors helped me realize that the remedy wasn't changing other people, it was changing me. Yes. You know, one time I was praying and God literally said to me, pull back your shoulders. Learn to look people in the eye when you're talking to them. Start behaving like I've called you and not like I haven't called you. You know, and one mentor said to me, stop letting people treat you like you are not deserving. You are the lead pastor in this church. You are the one anointed by God to lead this church. Behave like it. And they were right. Because as I changed me, people around me started to change in the way they treated me. Now, of course, there will still be some who don't, right? I still get angry, especially when it's outright discrimination and sexism. But now, I always ask myself, is it really them or is it me? Is there something I need to change that is contributing to the problem in our relationship? Or is there something I need to improve about my dynamics with these people? The first impression I project when I go into the room so that I can get where I need to go. So, can I tell you very honestly, yes, for you, some of it means that you know, some relationships, it means you have to cut them out. Because no matter what they do, they're not going to change. Yeah. For some relationships, it means saying no. And standing up for yourself and saying what you need from people. Yeah. In fact, this year, that is one of my resolutions, okay? For how to maintain my integrity in fights and not get depressed. is to say no to you treating me badly. Yeah. No, you will not treat me like a second-class citizen or like I am invisible. No, you will not disrespect my time or my person by being late to meetings or having no good reason and behaving badly to me. Yeah. No. <laughs> so you see, guys, there are some situations where you cannot live with integrity if you don't learn to say no. Yeah. Because the alternative is being two-faced. The alternative is not feeling a sense of belonging because you're pretending to be someone you are not. Now, now, let me qualify this, because some of you are going to start throwing tantrums. <laughs> it does not mean, okay, that, 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 that you don't have a filter. I have a filter. With some people, I say certain things. With other people, I'm 100% myself. But I am not two-faced. Are you here with me? So, so there will be other situations where you need to modify how you are coming across in order to get to where you want to go. So I realized for myself, I tend to come across too nice, which leads to people thinking they can talk over me, which sometimes leads to people thinking that I am a, a nurturer and not a leader. Actually, I don't know how you get the impression from me, but I don't know. Okay, so maybe you're the kind who's always adapting and compromising while people around you treat you badly and take advantage of you. Listen, integrity doesn't just mean having strong moral principles. It also means being strong in who you are. Yes. Integrity, right? Let me read to you the definition. The first one is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Yes. That's integrity 101. The second one is the state of being whole and undivided. That the whole of you walks into a room and not just half of you. Three, internal consistency or lack of corruption. Four, the condition of being unified, sound, or strong in your construction. So, I love this word, but it is a challenging word. 
Because integrity doesn't happen without deep reflection. It doesn't happen without taking responsibility for the quality of your relationships and your character. But in order to jive toward your dreams, in order to live the best you, you must be able to maintain your integrity in fights. Whether it's learning to live by your values and convictions despite pressure, or learning to be strong in the face of temptation to take the easy way out and avoid confrontation and change. Now, can I push this a little bit further? All of us have some area of our life that we find harder to change than others. Now, this varies according to our personality, to our upbringing. And when we are faced with those particular areas, we have a tendency to say, I have, but that's just me. I have, but that's just not me, right? Because changing in those areas, having to confront someone about the way they are hurting you or treating you is uncomfortable. So the character stuff is straightforward. If you don't want to do Integrity 101, I don't know how to help you already. You know, I remember I confronted someone a few years ago about being racist and they said, but pastor, that's just me. You telling me to change means that you are not accepting me for who I am. Are you here with me? Yeah. Wrong kind of integrity. Another person I confronted because everyone was having trouble working with them, you know, say, oh, but pastor, I'm just that way. Well, then change your way. Yeah. Are you here with me? Yeah. If your best you is racist or sexist or any ist, if your best you cannot work with anybody properly, if your best you is drama and politics, then it's time to change you. Yeah. But sometimes, there are areas that will always be us. There will be areas that are always us. For example, I'm very introvert. I don't like networking. But sometimes, if I need to get where I'm going, I've got to learn to fight and do networking. And find a way to do it while still maintaining my integrity. For example, I sent Tzu Han before me. He's, he goes to make friends first and then I come in second. Are you here? You know, so we've all got to learn to grow strong. We've all got to learn how to figure out and navigate our integrity in order to get to our dreams. We cannot just use the excuse, it is not us. Well, if it's always going to be not you, then you will never reach your dreams. Are you here with me? So learn to develop integrity, which is also strength in the fight. Integrity in the fight. Amen? Next one. Are you ready? Number three, beauty in the rough. (laughs) Yeah, I know, I know, I know. The second worship team is like, yeah, that's us. Okay. While joy is a choice that gives you positivity and zest for life, beauty is about having an inner calm and perspective about your situations. Being able to see the good, even in the rough or the pain, It's an appreciation and a gratitude that allows you to slow down, to take in and to learn so that you are better for the road ahead. So research has found, right, that this perspective, this attitude of gratitude is what allows people to weather pain and uncertainty and come out thriving. In fact, multiple studies have found that one of the major differences between successful and satisfied people and unsuccessful and dissatisfied people is their ability to be grateful and appreciative even in bad situations. So Ecclesiastes 3.10, let me read to you. It says here, I have seen the burden God has placed on us all, yet God has made everything beautiful for its time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Now, I like the Bible very much because it doesn't skim over pain. It doesn't gloss over how hard our lives, our human lives are. So whoever wrote Ecclesiastes, presumably tradition says it was King Solomon, but scholars are not really sure. But we'll just assume for today it's King Solomon, right? He says... Life is hard. God has put a heavy burden on us humans. We naturally want to know what's the meaning of life? What's the purpose of my existence? Is there life or legacy after death? 
And yet for all our faith in God, no matter how much we know or figure out, he says, we will never know everything. There are some things you will never know for sure. There are some things in life you will never 100% be at peace about. But here's the key to coping with this uncertainty. And it is the perspective that everything is beautiful in its time. So, friend, we've got to learn to appreciate the beauty in everything. I sound like the Oprah show right now, right, today. So, you see, just before this, where King Solomon says everything is beautiful in its time, he also writes, in verse 1, it says, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to cry and a time to laugh. A time to grieve and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to turn away. A time to search and a time to quit searching. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. And what does he conclude? In all of those times, these times, God has made it beautiful. Poetic, but true. A challenging perspective. But if you can't take in what Solomon is trying to say right here, it might just change your life. It might just set you free from that mistake or failure that you made. It might just help you let go of that hurt and bitterness and grief that's been weighing you down. It might just make the adversity and the fight you are going through a little less frustrating. It might motivate you to deal with a relationship with integrity. You know, you got to understand this, right, guys? Life isn't easy one-way truths. You know, very often truth, you know, what is true for some things is limited for other things. Or it's true only to a point and for only certain times in your life. Most of the time, life and truth, you know, life is often a duality of truths and in fact, a plurality of truth. So one of the translations of yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time is the Amplified Version where it says, He has made everything beautiful and appropriate in its time. So, Guess what? Pain is appropriate for us to grow. Grief is appropriate because human beings, our physical bodies will give out, we all die. It's the cycle of life. Failure is appropriate because we are more likely to change and learn when we make mistakes than if we don't. So if you can learn to see and appreciate beauty, even in the rough times, to accept that whatever it is was appropriate for its time, that it doesn't have to be less or more than what it is, then no moment in your life is wasted. Every situation becomes beautiful and valuable. Beauty in the rough. Now, finally, my last point for you is this. Elevate yourself in 2020 to the level of your dreams. Elevate yourself to the level of your dreams. Romans 12, 2, Amplified Version says, so here's what I want you to do. God, with God helping you, take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for Him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what He wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. So good, right? The Message Bible. So I just got to take this moment, right, to talk about Helena again. Is that all right? Where's Hel? Ah, there she is, squirming in her seat. (laughs) 
So I'm going to say it's been such a joy for me the past one, one and a half, two years watching her flourish. You know, Helen's been in our church for a long time, okay? She might be to date one of the oldest relics in our church next to Sue. They know I love them, okay? So when you've been an active Christian and a member for that long, I can tell you that there's no way that there hasn't been some low moments in that journey. You know, all the youth here, I want you to know, you know, in 2020, you should treasure the adults in church because they have so much experience in faith that they can share with you because Jesus is no longer just their theory or their hype, it is their lived experience. You know, when you're your youth, it's easy to follow God. When you're an adult, it gets a little bit harder. Amen? So Helena, you know, from the moment she came to our church when she was 16, 17 years old, she had this dream to be a champion for women and children in third world countries. Now, when you ask her last time about her dreams, year after year, faithfully, you know, she will tell you one day, our church will do humanitarian work. And one of the things I'm going to do with the humanitarian world is we are going to help women and we're going to help children. Yeah. Now, but of course, as you grow up, right, life starts to throw you curveballs. Disappointments, delays, falling short, failure, experiencing discrimination. And when enough things go wrong in our lives, you know, you can get really angry with God and angry with life. Yeah. And so that's what happened to hell for a period of time. Now, some Christians will think, look at that experience and go, okay, there goes her spotless Christian record, right? Still in church, but backslider in her heart. Oh, poor thing, poor thing, poor thing. But here's the thing, you know, that's what Christians say, but do you know what God says? God says, beautiful in its time. Appropriate in its time. And just like how all times of life are for a time, Pain is also only for a time. Yeah. Yeah. Just as good moments will pass, pain also passes. Yeah. Yes. So in the last three years, something happened. Time passed and Helena began to jive. So, you know, I started to notice, right? She started to learn to roll with the punches in life, to find joy and excellence despite difficult moments, despite not being given opportunities. And she learned to keep her integrity, not just in terms of her moral compass, but integrity in being herself a little bit more, learning to stand up for herself in the middle of a fight. Yeah. You know, she, she began to acknowledge, you know, I didn't think there used to be racism, but now I know there is racism, but it's not something to waste time being angry about. I'm just going to maneuver around it. Yeah. You know, she used to accept that this was the situation in life, but now she is changing it. And she started to see the beauty in how God works. You know, especially in the area of her book writing. And I've got to say, when I interact with her, I know this. She has elevated to the level of her dreams. She's been on top of everything. She's been diligently researching, diligently trying to pave the way for her dreams. She's there to dream that her books will not only help Singaporean kids, but the money from the, the Singaporean kids can go to kids in third world nations. You know, she's hoping but also holding it lightly so that if it doesn't happen, you know what, she'll find another way to make that happen. She's mature in her heart, in her thoughts, in her actions, in her knowledge, in her skills, in her abilities. She's elevated herself to the level of her dreams. So let me be real with you here. Is there a chance that what she's working on won't happen? Well, really unlikely at this point, but still possible, right? But can I tell you, I don't worry one bit for her anymore because she has elevated herself. You see, here's the key to jibing. Who you want to be comes before what you want to achieve. Because if you are structuring your whole life, young person, young adult, your whole life, your worldview around what you want to do, your perspective is too rigid. You will never get where you want to go joyfully 
with integrity, enjoying the beauty of your failures and successes, you just won't because you're too rigid. Your life is more likely going to turn out mediocre according to Carol Dweck because you've got a fixed, rigid, limited mindset and perspective about life. But when you focus instead on who you want to be, It doesn't matter if what you decide to do changes. Because you've got a growth mindset. If you are someone who's joyful in adversity, man, you know, you are just so positive. Listen, nothing will stop your acceleration even if adverse situations happen. If you, you're someone whose priority is learning and deepening your integrity, figuring out your values, growing your strength, growing your capacity, then what you can do and achieve is unlimited. If you are someone who can see beauty even in your pain, who can be grateful and appreciative to learn from every situation, I mean, wow, even bad things turn to your advantage. If you are someone who wants to elevate yourself to your best self, It will never matter what wind comes your way or how dreams change or evolve, you will still succeed. Because success is more about who you are than where you are going. Amen? So what is it to jibe? J-I-B-E. Jibe means to be in accord, to be in agreement. To shift your sails into whatever wind God and life brings your way. To go with the flow, to go with God. Now, I want to be clear. To jibe doesn't mean to conform or succumb to the direction of the wind. It's to ride it. Sometimes harness it to get where you need to go. To lean into it. Sometimes surrender to it. Sometimes be in creative conflict with it. Some people, however, succumb. Some people rebel against the change of the winds. Some people are so rigid that they break in the face of a different wind. But some people, the best sailors, they know how to jibe and jibe well. And those people, they may not end up exactly where they expected you know, or what they plan to do in the beginning, but they do live out their dreams and often those dreams are better than they could have imagined because they learn to jive with God and with life. So, so I want to ask you today, right, and give you a couple of minutes to think about this and write some stuff down. In 2020, what is an adversity I need to start being joyful in? And what am I going to do in order to be joyful. Number two, what is a fight that I'm having that I need to deepen my integrity in? Maybe for some of you, it's values and convictions that you need to get serious about. Maybe for some of you, it's something you need to change in your relationships with certain people in your life. Number three, which areas of my life do I need to recognize beauty and be grateful for? You know, for some of you here, are there some mistakes or struggles that you need to make peace with so that you can enjoy 2020? So that 2020 won't be another 2019 of regret and frustration and depression and anxiety. You know, change your perspective. Number four, what are some things I need to do in 2020 to elevate myself to the level of my dreams? You know, answer this question first this year before you set your goals. Who do you want to be? Then only then, and only then answer the question, what do I want to achieve? Because who you are is more important than what you will achieve. Are you here with me? If you take care of who you are, this achievement will begin to take care of itself. So turn to your other neighbor, will you say, will you jibe in 2020?